This morning we're going to be in Romans 11 in the New Testament, starting with verse 15. This morning we're going to be in Romans 11. And the last time, the message was titled Beauty for Ashes, and certainly that's a scriptural phrase. We find it in Isaiah, and it's a very powerful picture because Ashes are after everything's burnt. There's not even embers left. But God can do that in people's lives. He did that with the nation of Israel. If you've been a Christian for a while, I'm sure you've seen that he's done with you personally. He's done that with you. So that's what we covered last time. Uh, this morning's message is titled, A Lesson from Arbor Culture. Actually, my wife and I were out in the mall, and I found this shirt that has a lot of plants and stuff on it. So I said that would be perfect for Sunday's message. Some of you have commented on my shirt. My wife was actually impressed too. She usually buys my shirts, but this time she's like, oh, I can't believe you picked that out. So it has nothing to do with the message except for there's nice plants and stuff on it. So a lesson from Arbor Culture. We're going to look at that in three parts. And as we've been doing, it's kind of been a series here, a tradition, we've been speaking about Romans 1 and the attributes, the invisible attributes of God through nature. So we've kind of been doing this nature series. We'll just take a few minutes, if you want to show the vid video, to talk about the hummingbird, right? In Darwin's day, he did not have the science to understand the complexities of natural life, but many years later, we have. And the hummingbird is a fascinating bird. And no doubt that that was intelligent design. That didn't just happen the way it is. As a matter of fact, you can't even see their wings beating unless they use high speeds photography and then slow it down because the human eye can't pick up the smaller birds which can actually beat their wings 80 times per second. That was 80 times. I just snapped my fingers. And they do that all day long. Uh, they also can nosedive at 50 miles an hour. And we have the equipment now to be able to measure all these things, these empirical facts about these hummingbirds. Uh, when they fly, if you watch it in slow motion, their wings do sort of a, a figure eight pattern. There's an uplift and a down, there's an upstroke and a downstroke. They do it in a figure eight and they've actually trained these birds to fly in smoke chambers. And when you watch it in a smoke chamber, when they hover, they actually create these circular vortices. There are these undulations of, of smoke rings that just keep going down and down and it keeps them buoyant. Pretty impressive, isn't it? So the hummingbird, we also know that they expend so much, as you can see, so much energy during the day that in the evening they go into what's called a torpor. A torpor is a short-term hibernation and that is so they can cons conserve energy. I've actually seen videos of hummingbirds kind of eating late into the night and then they crash. Uh, and they, they hang upside down like bats. Their little claws hang onto the rim of a hummingbird feeder and they're just racked out cold, upside down, and they just go into a 6% metabolic rate until the next day. So everything, my, my only question is, does the hummingbird know how cool they are? You know what I'm saying? Because they are super cool. The more I study this, the more I find it fascinating. In addition, they have the mastery of being able to ingest sugars and to put out a maximum adenosine triphosphate yield, or ATP, which gives us energy. So um, I can go on, but that's just a little thing on the hummingbird and the beautiful attributes of God and his complexity in creation. So now we're going to jump in to Romans 11, verse 15. It says, now there's a context here, and I'm going to get to the context. For if they're being cast away, meaning Israel, is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, him speaking to Gentile believers, or largely Gentile believers, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches, but if you boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. 
Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear or respect. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. The goodness and severity of God. And folks, we really determine at what stage or characteristics we're going to come to him. The Lord eventually has to bring judgment upon the earth. If people choose to meet him on those terms, I think it's a foolish decision. But we don't have to. We can meet him now if we don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has already paid the penalty for our sins. Therefore, we escape judgment. So God has multiple natures. He's multiple, multifaceted, just like he made us in his image. He has severity. He has to judge. And when you look at this world, you say, it, it has to happen with all the horrible things that go on. But he also has goodness. And we get to determine on which terms we'll face God. The Bible's very deep. So he says... On those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. No matter, where, wherever you are in life, and people do this. Oh, I've made such a mess of life. I've done so many bad things. He could never possibly accept him. Not true. Absolutely not true. Especially now being in the age of grace. Whatever you've done... Confess it to him. You want to start following him. Well, today could be your day. For if, for if you were cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature in a, into a good olive tree, how much more will these, who are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So, one out of three is spiritual lessons in arboriculture and agriculture. I'll save verse 15 for the end. When we look at the scripture here, right in verse 16, the first root is holy, the lump is holy, you kind of have to go back to the Old Testament. You kind of have to go back to when the Lord uh, and his people, you know, they had the grain harvest and they had fruit, and they would give him what was called the first fruits. They were thankful to God, and the beginning part of the harvest, the first stuff that came out, was offered to him. And we see that in Numbers 15 and Leviticus 23. And basically, whether it was the lump or the sheaf or whatever the thing that you harvested, you know, that would be offered to God. But what he's saying is that the first fruits are also part of the main harvest, which is really also part of the gleanings. So when we start to look at that, we see that when we're speaking about Israel, we're speaking about this possibility that wherever they are in that spectrum, they can come back and receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is very important. Israel as a nation today and leadership today, and we saw that in Jesus' day, has largely rejected their Messiah. And not something that I'm saying. This is something in the Old Testament. Dozens of prophets spoke about the rejection, the coming rejection of the Messiah. And there was a reason for it. Because they kind of bought into a works-based system. But let's talk about Christianity. There's plenty of churches today that have done the same thing. You know, do, do they read the Bible? The Bible says that salvation is a free gift from God. We don't work our way into heaven. You know, it isn't by our works or our ability. It's the free gift of God's grace. So we look at this situation, and we look at the harvest as well with respect to Israel. There's a parallel here. God's, God is the foundation to everything. We heard in the Old Testament, we read in the Old Testament that Jesus is the cornerstone. So the foundation of God is clearly established. On that foundation was the patriarchs, the prophets, right? The way of salvation through the Messiah, Abraham. We covered this, Romans chapter 4. Abraham believed. Uh, righteousness was imputed to Abraham, not because he worked for salvation, but because he trusted God. Right? God did all the work. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but have eternal life. So the way we have the free gift of, of salvation is through the cross. Right? And this was prophesied many years prior. So Paul now moves through this first fruit example to a horticultural, or arboricultural, or whatever, you, whatever it's plant or tree you're snipping, this is a, a grafting procedure. How many people are familiar or have ever done any form of grafting? 
on the vegetation, a tree, right? I, I have. Well, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, you're definitely in. We're, we're going to be talking about the plant sciences and the life sciences this morning. We've got the hummingbird, and we're going to talk about the grafting. This is actually fantastic when you think about it. it was actually a, there's actually a car, and before I studied grafting, I'm like, what, is, what does that mean? People name these cars different things. The Scion, right? The Scion, I, I never drove one. I don't own one. But the actual Scion is the part of the the tree, that's the branch that you want to graft in to the rootstock. So you have the rootstock, the foundation, you have the scion, which is the branch. And what you do is you do this procedure where you have benefits that you like in the root. Maybe it's a hardy root, it's a hardy tree, and maybe the fruit bearing part isn't great, but you found the fruit bearing part somewhere else and you say, that's a great fruit bearing tree, but the the roots, you know, they rot and there's problems. So what you do is you get the both, best of both worlds and you graft the scion onto the rootstock. And there you have grafting. It's pretty fantastic. Um, this hybrid now is, is, has to be held together until the vascular tissue of the tree starts to repair itself. If you remember uh, plant biology, the xylem and the phloem, it's vascular tissue that starts to regenerate. Folks, I'm just going to say this. As I get older, technology doesn't do it for me. I actually, as I get older, I'm really more excited about God's world. And I think our culture it has problems and there's a lot of issues and people suffer with all kinds of things, but they're not looking at God's nature for therapy. You know, I've actually done wound care. I have a, I had a, a tree, the pink dogwood, beautiful tree, and it it, uh, through a winter storm, it, the branches got loaded down and it, it, it was wet, wet uh, snow and it split it down the middle. And I was like, oh, I can't let go of my pink dogwood, you know what I'm saying? So I actually binded its wounds. I used rope, I used tape, I um, used a salve to keep the infection out. And just like your flesh, if a knife cuts you, your body will repair itself. Well, the tree did the same thing. And after a few months, I was able to take the, the gauze off, the bandage, and it had a scar, but it came back to life. I actually prayed for the tree, too. It was one of my favorite trees. My wife and I are very earthy, crunchy. I'm a beekeeper. She's a master gardener. And um, we have some fun with, with this stuff. <laughs> so, so you have this, this hybrid now. It has to wound. It has to care for itself. And here's the thing, too. Again, in Darwin's day, he didn't know these things. He didn't know anything about the plant cell because he didn't have the equipment to look at it. But how is it? Just like human flesh, right? The tree is, is damaged, and the tree can repair itself. You even see bark that covers over a wound. Some trees are better than others at doing this, and you can see, well, there was a wound there. Maybe a branch was cut off. Maybe, you know, other things had happened. So I just look at God's world, and I'm like, this is impressive. You know, I go outside, I take a walk, I pray, and, you know, and, and it's just a very, it's exhilarating, it's comforting, and uh, it, it really brings peace and joy. Amen? Try it sometime. <laughs> so they actually have grafting tools today. They kind of look like pruning shears, and you have one shape for the, for the rootstock and one shape for the scion. And what happens is you, you press it and you, it gets off the excess tissue and it makes like a puzzle piece, like a jigsaw puzzle. Then you take the other side, you change the, the head of it, you press it again, that side, and it's like the, the male and the female end. And then when you put them together, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Then you bind it and it has a tendency to hold together because of the shapes that the tool makes. Has anybody ever worked with that? Again, again, some good stuff this morning. So we could talk about plant biology this morning and hummingbirds, but there is a lesson that God wants us to know here. So we got all that stuff out of the way, and the Apostle Paul takes these examples from nature, and he sort of makes a, par a parable, if you will. In a spiritual sense, Israel had God as a the foundation. They had Christ as the cornerstone prior to him coming. It was prophesied in Scripture. They had the patriarchs, they had the prophets, they had Abraham. It had a good rootstock. But the plan of salvation through the Messiah and the free gift versus a works-based system was not palatable to many. So as a leadership, they largely rejected 
of that situation. Again, all prophesied in the Old Testament. We've been going through this for months. However, this gave the opportunity when that natural branch was broken off by its own will, it gave the opportunity for the largely Lent Gentile believers to be grafted in. Now, this is important to understand. Individual versus national. So, there's millions of Jewish people who have accepted Jesus since Jesus came. The early church was Jewish. I went through all of this. Um, we've been going through this for a while. Individually, personally, many Jewish people have come into the fold, but as a nation, they've largely rejected it. There's actually a large following. There's thousands of them, tens of thousands in Israel today. There's a huge movement for Jewish people to come to their Messiah. It's an incredible thing, but the nation still is with the old system. It's not there yet. So anybody can come to salvation. That's a beautiful thing. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 12, God says to Abraham, in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What was he speaking about? Speaking about the coming Messiah. You know, Abraham was so cool. I just imagine Abraham talking to God, and he probably thought about a lot of things that God said, and in his own lifetime, many things didn't come to pass. But this was God, so he took it to heart. But it's true. Christ came through Abraham's line. And all the families of the earth, Gentiles and Jews, were blessed with salvation through the Messiah. Pretty exciting. Now, I want to read um, some good news that we're going to see in our future. I believe firmly that we're all going to see this at some point. If you would turn with me in the Old Testament, Zechariah 12, starting with verse 10. This is where Jesus speaks, well, Jesus speaks about the second coming in the Gospels. He speaks about it's going to be so obvious to them that they're not going to be able to miss it. He's going to, you know, Revelation tells us how he's going to, you know, return from heaven on a white horse. So Zechariah 12.10 says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. I believe the Hebrew word is dokar, which means literally to pierce through, as in, as in crucifixion. Now, this is a future event. It's prophesied in the Old Testament before it happens. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So the nation will see the obvious nature of the Lord coming through the clouds, and they're going to see, the Bible tells us, he still bears the marks of the cross, and they're going to they're gonna be like, wow, well, it's pretty obvious now, can't deny it. And they're going to grieve, and they're going to mourn, but they're going to repent, and they're going to accept him nationally. So that's the good news in the future. God is good. He has a plan for everything. And in that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Raman in the plain of Megiddo. So, good stuff. Verses 18 through 22, he tells, now this is a Jewish rabbi, Paul, telling largely Gentile believers not to get prideful, that they were the wild olive branch grafted into this rootstock of this natural olive tree. This is a blessing. This is a, a, a love offering. This is grace. So don't, you know, and it's really sobering to largely Gentile Christians, me being one of them. A reminder to be faithful to the Jewish people, right? And a reminder to love all people and do the best we can with sharing our faith so the unsaved could be saved, no matter what background they're from. There's also a, uh, I would say, a warning against anti-Semitic behavior in the church, which in the Middle Ages, we saw the powerful church at the time did do. This is all history. It's not a contrivance that they did persecute the Jews and the forced conversions and the inquisitions. Did they read their Bible? Like, that's my, that's my, go, my default question when it comes to any branch of Christianity that has an anti-Semitic leaning. Do they read their Bible? Did they read Romans? How could they behave like that after reading Romans or reading Romans? We're reminded not to be prideful, but to stand by faith. That means we don't stand by merit or works. We don't work our way into heaven. The work has already been done by, the, by Jesus on the cross. So I'm just going to give you another example from horticulture and arboriculture since we're on the subject. If you would turn to me, or turn with me, you could turn to me as well, John 15 in the New Testament. Jesus, this is under the relationship of believers to Christ. He uses another example. 
Jesus was the, I believe that the Apostle Paul was really good at parables because he closely studied Jesus. You know, Jesus is God. He's the Son of God. So Jesus used these simple, everyday things that we could see out in the field or in that agrarian culture, and he would make a spiritual truth out of it. So it says, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Could you imagine, like, we're so used to the scripture, right? I mean, I've studied the scripture for over 20 years. Imagine as the disciples and his followers hearing that for the first time. So the Lord is likening himself to a vine, the source. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may, may bear more fruit. Pruning doesn't feel good. Well, to us anyway. I don't know how the trees feel. I don't know. I'm not a, a, an expert on their central nervous system if they have one. But there's a lot of ministries that will teach you, come to this church. Every Sunday, you'll be walking on air. We're going to make you feel great about yourself. We're going to build your self-esteem. That's not reflected in the scripture. And those people will always fill stadiums because the human heart is, is selfish. It wants to hear these things. But the Bible tells us otherwise. So the father is the vine dresser. So even the fruit producing branches, when there's a problem, he prunes them. And folks, it doesn't feel good to get pruned, doesn't it? If you've been a Christian long enough, if some, if, listen, if I told you up here, I, I'd be lying, and I, I don't tell you up here, oh, just come up and become a Christian. Everything becomes perfect. I would be lying to you. Actually, things can become more challenging, but now you have the, the Lord walking with you in that journey. So he prunes, prunes, prunes. Why? That it may bear more fruit. There's some things about us, folks, that God wants to prune because they're not healthy for us, and they're not healthy for him using us to his glory. So he prunes. I said that ten times already. Three, <laughs> he speaks to his disciples. He says, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The word is purifying. Abide in me and I in you. Now here's the relationship. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. This is a relationship. This isn't, I'm, I'm joining a church. I'm joining a denomination. Well, my parents were saved, so I'm probably good. No. I put a pithy Bible quote on Facebook. I'm a Christian. It's a relationship. Verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. A little repetitive. And, you know, repetitive, it's repetitive here. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, Jesus says to his followers, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and it is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Sobering. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. For this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So we're on the subject of arboriculture and horticulture, and there you go. There's another great example of us. You know, I've done pruning, right? When I got married, I, I just, <laughs> my wife is, she's great. And she's a master gardener and she kind of brought out the soft side of me, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, she's watching me sometimes. I'm like, I've been hanging out with you for, I've been married almost 20 years. Of course, you're going to see me, you know. But I, I read the Bible, I look at nature, and it's just, it's a fun thing. But I've done pruning, right? You prune a, a branch, no matter how clean you make it, when the branch falls to the ground, within a few hours, those leaves wither up and the branch dies. Why? Because you've cut off its life force. You've cut off of its source. And folks, Jesus makes that analogy. Spiritually, we can't do anything without him. But the closer we are, the more we're receiving those spiritual nutrients from the Lord, we can do all things. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Important stuff to look at. So, we must remain in Christ. There's warnings against being cut off. Now, it's not for anybody who's a new believer to freak out because we, we read things, and I'll, let's bring this to today. We read things. Joshua Harris was a Christian author, decided he wasn't a Christian anymore. He also decided he wasn't a husband anymore. A little change of lifestyle there. Uh, Marty Sampson was a worship person at Hillsong. He decided he's walking away from the Lord. So here's my, my warning against celebrity Christianity. A lot of them are phonies, folks. A lot of them join, jump into the Christian genre because there's money to be made. And honestly, a lot of them think that Christians are gullible. A lot of them leave 
these genres because they find that there's more money to be made in the world. These people never go away. They always remake themselves. So don't freak out about when you see that stuff. Hold on a second. Let me check my pulse. It hasn't gone up one beat. People will leave. They'll say, I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm not moved by it. You know, I've been walking with him over 20 years. It, do it doesn't affect my life at all. I feel bad for them. I really do. But the Bible tells us, 1 Timothy 4, that in the latter times, many will depart from the faith. The Bible already tells us. It warns us these things are going to happen. 2 Timothy 4, due to itching ears. And in America, there's a lot of itching ears. They'll actually, people will actually, they'll go from church to church to church until they find a doctrine that suits their lifestyle or how they feel or um, makes them feel good. You're picking the church on the wrong reasons. You need to pick a church, and there's great churches around here that teach the unadulterated entire Word of God, Old and New Testament, because there's life in the Word. It's the, it's the Word that strengthens us and, and keeps us grounded to Jesus. Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, believers, follow my Word. So if we go to a church where all they talk about is politics and current events and throw in a verse here and there, that's not a church, that's a social gathering. Because the Bible says that these things are going to happen because of itching ears, they will refuse sound doctrine and they will leave sound doctrine. Second Timothy 2, it says the falling away, the great apostasy must come before this great global movement and the Antichrist, you know, the great globalist, the world's great globalist comes on the scene. So we shouldn't be surprised, but adding to the problem are ministries that want to bring in the cash, that want to fill every empty seat, so they preach in a way that make people feel good. That's not what preaching is. It is not. You have to take the, the delicious things and you have to take some of the bitter things, right? John and the prophets, they, they said, and I swallowed the word and it was sweet to my mouth, but it was bitter in my stomach. Sometimes when we really deep dig into the word, we see that we're not right and we have to change. People don't like that in American culture. It's tough here. Because all I got to do is go home and look on Facebook and look at some of these places and there's these gimmicks, gimmicky churches, you know, celebrity churches, mesmerizing, you know, what they do and how they get people pumped up and they appeal to their feelings and their flesh and not to their spirit. Verse 25, continuing on in Romans, he says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that hardening in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel as a nation will be saved in the future. We read this, Zechariah 12. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God doesn't make a promise and take it back. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet now have obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. So two out of three, um, the promise of Israel's restoration. Now this is interesting. Every so often, you know, I'll get into the, the message. We'll talk about encouraging things. We'll talk about theology. We'll talk about doctrine. This is eschatology. In other words, this is like end times kind of stuff. And it's really fascinating to study. Um, and that's one of the beautiful things about Christianity. It's the only faith system that predicts the future and is, is right 100% of the time. Anything that Jesus said, some things that Jesus said haven't been fulfilled yet, but you can see we're going in that direction. The book of Revelation, the Old Testament prophets, stuff is pretty powerful. That was one of the things with me. I was a prove it to me, you know, type of guy. I got a, a, a degree in Rutgers, a four year degree, you know, studied math and science. It took me a while, it took me a few months, but I'm like, man, I can't get away from this stuff. And the more I do my own research, the more I realize stuff is right. So, Prophecy did it for me. It was one of the things. Certainly the love of God. Um, it's just a great package. But verse 25, he speaks about until the fullness and completion of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, God knows that last Gentile person 
to come into the fold, right? So the first fruits were the, Jew, the church and Christianity, the Jewish people. The major harvest was largely Gentile, although there's some Jewish, and in the beginning there was, there was mostly Jewish with some Gentiles. The gleanings will be the end, in end times, where Israel will nationally come to this repentance and believing in the Messiah. They'll see it for their own eyes. Luke 21, Jesus speaks about the times of the Gentiles to be fulfilled. Again, we're full-bordered Israel, which we don't have right now, takes center stage. So you can see a lot of these convergent eschatological uh, prophecies. Verses 26 through 27, what we see here is, and again, if you, I th believe even the, the Bibles in the pews have this. You have regular font, and then when in the New Testament they refer back to the Old Testament, you have italics, right? Everybody awake? <laughs> Thank you. I can't see all the heads from here. Uh, so that's a good thing. So what happens is, is he's referring back to the Old Testament, which he's been doing all throughout this book, to prove his point. So... Verses 28 through 32, you see a lot of back and forth. He said to the Gentiles, you were largely faithless in the beginning. And then the opportunity came, and many of you became faithful. Israel was faithful in the beginning. They became faithless. They'll become faithful again. So you see a lot of these, these back and forth situations. I'm going to leave you with this. Well, I'm almost done. <laughs> so, all right, I'll just make the history brief. After 9-11, um, some time passed, and I went down there with a group of people and, you know, cleanup efforts, and, you know, I thought everything was fine. I didn't see this particulate in the air, so we didn't really use apparatus. Anyway, a lot of stuff got in my sinuses and my lungs, and I had to go through a series of five or six surgeries. And I don't remember how I even found this otolaryngologist, eye, ear, nose, and throat surgeon, but, man, this guy is the bomb. And I actually told a lot of people, if anyone is struggling, I think I told you about him too, if you come to me personally, I'll give, him, give you his name and tell him I sent you. But I go into the office, very, very by the book, very serious, got a ton of people in the waiting room. And he, um, Orthodox Jew, right, fluent in Hebrew, and I felt <laughs> that God was kind of pushing me, well, I'm, I'm, what the heck, I keep having all these surgeries, I, I see him in the hospital, I see him in the office. He did a sleep apnea surgery. Heck, I might as well tell him about Jesus. So I feel like God's like prompting me, and, and I'm, you know, in my flesh, I'm thinking, the guy's fluent in Hebrew, he knows the entire Old Testament. Ah, what do I have to lose? Let me give it a shot. So whenever I saw him, I had limited time, and I would pray about what I was going to, my bullet points, because there were other patients in, in the room. I started telling him about the Lord. I actually gave him a book called The Search for Messiah, written by a Jewish doctor. I said, this is written by a Jewish doctor. <laughs> he reads the book. He actually now starts engaging me when I come into the office. He goes on the church website. Now, I didn't ask him to do this. I come in one day, and he goes, I've been listening to you on the church website. He goes, very fascinating. I almost fell off the chair. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know, it, and folks, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just being faithful. It's what we're all supposed to do. So long story short, I, I think at this point, I haven't seen him in a while, but I send Christians to him and so they can bug him too and reinforce about Jesus Christ. Just be faithful to people. You know what I'm saying? Just be faithful to people. Um, I actually developed a good rapport with him. I email him once in a while. Um, hopefully I don't get problems again so I don't have to go back and see him. But uh, I do email him. I, you know, I kind of built a, a friendship with him. You know, there were things that he was taught. He goes to one of the premier temples in the area. All the echel high echelon professionals go there. I'm trying to speak in generalities on purpose. And his whole time and his whole experience, he wasn't taught the prophecies about the Messiah. So he read some. He knew the Mishnah. He knew the Talmud. He knew all these, you know, Hebrew writings. But he and then he went into his Bible and saw what I was telling him was true. So now he's starting to read Zechariah. He's starting to read Isaiah. He's starting to read Psalm 22. And he's like, his whole life, he's never been shown this. Just be faithful, you know? I would never have expected it to go the way it did, but the Lord prompted me to do it, and I did it. So we need to be faithful to all people and in all things. What is our goals in life? 
here's a question. What do we do all summer? Don't call it out. Uh, was the Lord at all involved in our itinerary over the summer? Or was it all about us? This is a problem in the American church, by the way. What do we do all summer? Do we take a break from God because of our summer vacation and our itinerary? I don't know. I can only answer for myself. I would ask parents, too. You know, kids, I call them kids because I'm 52, um, going back to college. Is it more important to you as a parent that your boys and your girls get a good degree and make a lot of money? Or is it more important that when they die, we're all in the same place? Because some of these colleges can become indoctrination camps. I do a lot of apologetics. I do a lot of debate. And I went to college for four years, and I experienced And I thought to myself, how do some of these people even become professors? I wasn't even saved back then. So talk to your kids. What is most important in life when all this ends? Where did 51 years of my life go? I got robbed. I want to file a complaint. Where did it go? I remember when I was six years old. Man, it goes fast. And then you step into eternity. What's most important in our lives? Being faithful to, to God and running the race well or getting stuff in the world? I got a good education. I'm glad I got a degree hanging up on my wall. I got training and stuff. But that's not the most important thing to me. My focus has changed since I became a Christian. I just want to encourage you with that. And even if it sounds like something else, I want to encourage you with that. Verse 33, continuing last few verses, he says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! Exclamation point. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen. For three out of three is the mind of God who can know it. And this is, folks, no matter what. Do you think as the pastors, like we don't struggle with stuff? You don't think calamities happen in our lives? Come on. But we always have to land on this. You know, we have to land on this. When it, you don't feel like God, well, I'm just being honest with you. I'm not feeling it today. I'm not feeling it this week. I'm going through a dry season. I feel like I'm praying and I'm not getting answers. Every Christian goes through this, folks. But this is where we have to land on. This is the place that we have to land on. Believing Him, trusting Him. Trust is in seeing. Trust a lot of times is not seeing. And a lot of the way that I know that God was with me and he guided me was through hindsight. I can't see the future. And some, when I'm in the eye of the storm, I'm not feeling it. Then a year goes by and I look back and go, God was with me the whole time. Man, how could I be so stupid? Folks, I'm just being transparent with you. I'm being honest with you. And I hope I can be. But he references the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Job. And they all said the same thing. Isaiah went through trouble. Jeremiah, they called the weeping prophet. He had a really tough ministry. And Job lost a lot of his family in a calamity. But they all came and they all landed back. They all parachuted onto the drop zone. This is where we need to be. We have to trust him. Right now, we walk by faith and not by sight. There will be a future dispensation where everything will be sight. Faith will be gone because we'll be in his presence. Isn't that amazing? That's exciting to me. It can only get better from here. Even if it gets worse temporarily, in the end, it can only get better. So, watered-down preaching makes worldly, materialistic, and, child, and childish Christians, and we're starting to see this in celebrity Christianity. They all are clamoring for the camera to call Christianity today and a lot of these secular uh, journalists because they want as much attention as they can get. So you walk away from the faith but you have to smear Jesus' name while you're doing that? Read some of their testimony. Let their words speak for themselves. But I wonder if some of them actually ever got saved in the first place. I know some people who've come to this church from some of these flashy ministries, and they said, yeah, the music was amazing. But when we sat down to read the word, I got about 10 or 12 minutes, and I left there not even knowing what the preacher was saying. <laughs> I've actually had this before, where it's been said to me personally, 
it took me a while to get used to a 40-minute sermon. <laughs> Coming from a 12 or 13-minute sermon, but I'm getting used to it, and I love it. Because it's, it's the word. There's something I can, I can digest. There's something I can sink my teeth into. So here you have a well-educated rabbi, fluent in Hebrew, fluent in the entire Bible up to this point, admitting he knows so little when it comes to God. And we will run into frustration every time where we try to figure God out, where we try to figure out every facet of who he is to get him to perform for us. This must be our default position. Amen? If we're taught wrong, it's only going to cause us to stumble. And it's going to cause a depression. It's going to cause, we have to get the entire counsel of God. Verse 15, I'll leave it with this. I know I'm going back. It says, for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the word, world, what will be their acceptance be but life from the dead? And I shared with you, we could talk about hummingbirds and arboriculture, but the bottom line is, what is the word trying to say to us? He even speaks about the whole nation, Zechariah 12, nationally. Imagine what that's going to look like. Everyone's going to be looking up, and they're going to see it for themselves. Life from the dead. I shared with you a few sermons ago how God took all the carbon and the hydrogen and the atom, uh, the, the oxygen and the sulfur, and he took all these compounds together. He made a man. He made Adam. But Adam was not alive yet. It wasn't until he breathed the breath of life. God, Could you picture God putting, going right up to Adam's face and breathing the breath of life through his nostrils, and all of a sudden, Adam was alive? Wow, I hope there's a video of that somewhere when I get to heaven. We all came to, to life, all of you in this room, through our moms. That's a fact. Adam had a different experience. But we all came out of that womb, <gasps> breathed in the air, probably started screaming our heads off. We were born, all, everyone here, to my knowledge, you all look like you're conscious, we were all born physically. What the Bible says, in order to have eternal life, we must be born again of the Spirit. It doesn't mean go to a church that says born again. It doesn't mean call yourself a born again Christian. It means to literally have an experience with God, to be born again. And this journey that we've made in life where our heart's been beating and our lungs have been inhaling and exhaling, there comes a point in time where you actually go to the next level where you're not only alive physically, but you're alive spiritually. And that's what it's all about. And then what? And then we stay as close to Jesus Christ as possible. And then the Bible tells us all these promises. Revelation 21, I read this at funerals. No more crying, no more sadness, no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Those torturous memories that you can't get out of your head, they're going to be gone. You're going to be at peace through eternity, and you're going to be with the living God. Amen? So folks, in context, we're talking about Israel, but I know that I know that I know on any given Sunday there's somebody here who hasn't given their life to Jesus Christ. You don't have to join our church. It's not about a denomination. It's none of that stuff. Not connected to money. It's giving your life to the Lord because He gave His life for yours. Let's pray. Father in heaven, You are so good. No matter what's going on, what we're dealing with, Lord, that must be our default position. That you didn't come to make us comfortable here, to give us utopia here. You came to rescue us from this rotting world, this sin-filled, decaying world, to pull us into your world. And I would just pray, is if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus, give your heart to him today. Folks, we know. Think about your life on a daily basis. Do I really know the Lord? Do I really walk with Him? Do I ever pray to Him except for when I'm going through a difficult time and I want Him to bail me out? I used to do that before I was a Christian. I'm ashamed to say that I might not have talked to Him for another week until I was not saved. I had no living relationship with Him. I just used Him. And I'm just admitting that. So as the worship team does worship, if there's anybody here who hasn't, made that step of faith, I would ask you while, the, while they play to come up to the front. I'll lead you in a prayer. They'll give you a free Bible. And you start your walk with Him. We're just here to introduce the two of you. The rest is up to you. You get out of it what you put into it. You come forward if that's your desire.